Ed and me to be here. <clears throat> and I uh, just want to briefly to introduce what we, uh, the super organism. And uh, let me start with uh, a simple definition of a superorganism. What is a superorganism? You could say it is a group of organisms which are so tightly organized and uh, tightly united uh, that they develop collectively traits which uh, resemble traits of a true normal organism. Now, there are not many examples in the living world which we can really call superorganisms, but we find plenty of them in the so-called eusocial insects, or truly social insects. Now, such eusocial insects are uh, characterized by a distinct division of labor <clears throat> between one or a very few reproductive individuals and many non-reproductive, sterile individuals. Uh, those societies we find in the social insects. Uh, this is mine, I guess. Yes. <clears throat> you you see so one of these marvelous superorganisms here in this mound building ants of in Europe. Uh, there live hundreds of thousands or millions of ants in these mounds, but there is only one or a very few reproductive individuals, the uh, so-called queens, as you see here. All these other individuals are also female, so all these social insect societies, especially in the Hymenoptera, are female societies, but these uh, individuals have occasionally ovaries, uh, but the ovaries are rudimentary, and they do not, uh, under normal conditions, reproduce. Now, uh, let's come back to the superorganism concept. You can see such an insect society as one unit with a reproductive unit, the sexual organs, the reproducing organs, oops, uh, the queen, and the somatic or cell body the, 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 the somatic bodies of the superorganism, the cells, the organs which keep this superorganism super alive, the workers. Now, in order that such a superorganism works, we need, and that the division of labor system works, because also among these uh, non reproductive individuals, there is a division of labor. You need a communication system. No organism would work our organism or any other organism would work without means of communication. Uh, our organs communicate with one another and this keeps us alive. So I would even say communication biology is at the core of biology. Every biologist literally who wants to understand the, how, how life works, works on communication, whether it works on the cellular level or on the organismic level. So very briefly, such a superorganism is uh, oops, this one? <laughs> uh, the individuals communicate all the time, either by tactile signal, as you see here between these two ants, or most of the cases by chemical means. The ants are masters of chemical communication. They are little chemical factories where they produce so-called pheromones, signal substances. And I give you one uh, simple example. Uh, uh, this ant, for example. Normally, it runs like this, and when they communicate and recruit, for example, to new food so uh, sources, they show a behavioral, behavior, uh, behavioral communication behavior, this jerking behavior, but most, the most importantly, they lay a chemical trail. This one now lays a trail by dragging uh, this part of the body over the ground. Now we have a close look what is at this part. There is a big gland, as you see here, and she bends this abdomen forward and discharges secretion from these glands on the ground. And apparently, this secretion stimulates nest mates to follow. Now you want to prove this. Uh, Ed was one of the great pioneers who first time really developed in the, in the early 60s uh, uh, a bioassay for this. And then following 
many, many uh, uh, studies have been done, and we now know this chemical communication down to the molecular level. So what you do is you dissect out this gland, make a, a microsurgery, make a chemical extract, and then you make the bioassay. You have uh, the ends all in, in the nest box, and you have a piece of paper in front of the nest box, and you draw two pencil lines just for your own orientation. And then with a micro syringe, you draw a line, a chemical line, with the extract you got out of this gland along one line, and then along the other line, you make the control. And in this case, you use the poison gland. Now you open the box. What happens? You see the ants follow beautifully this line <clears throat> where you, which you drew with this gland I just showed you. And no ant follows the poison gland. So now you have identified the gland. Now you can go on and study what the, the chemistry is and so on. So I just wanted to give you this one example to show that these superorganisms, they have the division of labor between the reproductive and the non-reproductives. And the non-reproductives have to communicate to partition the tasks they have to do. You saw there was a remarkable difference in size. The reproductive individual, the queen, was much larger, uh, sometimes double the size of the other, or even much more. But there are other societies and societies, ancestral or primitive societies, where you do not find this difference. Here, these individuals all look alike, have the same size. The dots are just made by us, the color dots, because we wanted to identify them individually. Each one has the same number of, the you know, same ovaries, and actually, surprisingly, 80% of these individuals are even mated. So they have to carry the sperm of males, which the the superorganism I have shown you before, the workers are not mated. They, they, they cannot lay eggs, they cannot uh, mate, they don't have the organs. But they still have it, so it's a primitive trait. You can call this also a superorganism. However, this would be a superorganism which still, uh, where there is still a lot of friction within the society, competition. Who can reproduce? They fight in a, in a, a ritualized fighting, for example, trashing each other with the antennae, or it can change to a real wrestling fight, and those which then win will lay the eggs. But they will not always stay on top. There will be revolutions. As soon as the reproductive individual wanes in their reproductivity, they will be displaced by others, younger individuals, which try to get up on top. So there is always a sort of friction within the society. Now, I show you this in a brief movie clip. You see this ritualized trashing with the antennae, moving back and forth, back and forth. They're testing out who is stronger. And uh, this can go on, and then finally it can escalate. This is wrestling fight. And, and this goes on. They don't kill each other. They just wrestle, really. At the end, uh, the winner uh, is determined, and uh, as I showed you in the picture, and that which wins lays the eggs. So you see here now and one of the winner individuals pulling out the egg, and it will be so reproductive for a year perhaps, and then she will certainly be displaced. So when you look at such societies, you see a lot, let's assume this is a symbol for the whole society, this is another society, here another, here another one, and you see there's a lot of uh, competitive interaction going on within the society. When you look whether there is interaction going on between societies, you find almost none. They don't have territories, they don't fight against, they don't conduct wars between societies. Their problem is still within society interaction. So there is no, almost no interaction between societies. And you, as an evolutionary biologist, you can say there is still a great deal of selection going on on the individual level within the society, because those which win have a, and reproduce have a higher personal fitness than the others which do not reproduce. Now, however, I go and show you what Ed and I call the true or ultimate superorganism. These are the viva ants, for example. I'll give you a couple of examples now. The viva ants are called viva ants that live in the, uh, in the old world tropics. 
because they built their beautiful nests, the leaf tent nests, uh, in a remarkable cooperative fashion. Do you see the pictures well down there? It is still very light, yeah? Okay. <clears throat> in order to build them, they, build, they, they form living chains. One end hooks on the other until they reach the end of the leaf, and then they shorten the chain. And if one chain is not powerful enough, they form more chains and heave up the leaf. And once the leaf is in the right position, a crew holds the leaf in the position, and other ants move into already existing nests and bring out their last instar larvae. These last instar larvae in other ant species normally spin a cocoon. And within this cocoon, they, they pupate to become an adult ant. But in this case, the last instar larvae are used as spinning shuttles or weaving shuttles that are held by the nest, uh, by the workers between with the mandibles, and uh, the larvae respond to a tactile signal this worker gives. They just touch the cheek of the, uh, the sides of the uh, larvae, and uh, then the larva releases silk from a labial gland. Now she's moved back, forth, back and forth, back and forth, and this way the leaves are woven together. Now, uh, as I always like to say, you, you can call this tool use, depending on your taste. Uh, Ed and I, we called it child labor. <clears throat> <laughs> now you go on and you have these beautiful nests, you know, and one colony lives in hundreds of such nests spread over many trees in the uh, forest. Uh, they are highly territorial. As you see, this is the ant which patrols the territory. She is, sees me uh, when I try to photograph her and threatens me. They have be excellent vision. And as soon as a, a foreign ant ventures too far into the territory of the residence ants, the foreign worker will be attacked. They instantly recognize the foreign worker. They have a chemical uniform, which is colony specific. Now, uh, and once a foreign worker shows up, this is always a signal for the resident ants. There are more to come. And uh, they send up uh, recruiting ants. This ant, for example, moves up to the nest trees, to these leaf nests. There's a barrack nest, actually, it's a special uh, group of ants which live in this barrack nest. They lay a chemical trail, as you see here, the chemical, that, uh, the applicator of the trail. And however, when they find, when they encounter nestmates, they go through a strange behavior. They show aggressive behavior, as if they would attack this nestmate, but it's only an icon. It's a symbolic thing. They show for a split second aggressive display, uh, and in this way say, walk down this trail, down there is an invasion. They use the same trail pheromone when they recruit a new food sources, but then they show a totally different display. They show a wackle display. So you see there's a primitive syntax even, as you uh, linguists would not agree with me, but they combine two different signals to give a specific information. Now this is the uh, display uh, behavior shown in greater detail. Uh, what happens, the nest mates approach like this, show briefly also aggressive behavior, they respond. And then they move down this trail. And then, of course, as you see here, hell breaks out. They really fight to the death. And in this way, these colonies defend huge territories. Each dot is a major forestry in the Shimba Hills in Kenya, uh, where I did the field study. Uh, you see uh, each is a major forestry. And this is one colony occupying such a large area. This is another colony, another one. And in between, you see these corridors, which we like to call no ants land. <laughs> now, I ask you, you have the ultimate cooperation in this nest, as I demonstrated to you. There is literally no aggressive interaction within the colonies. Total harmony, in fact. But you see aggressive interaction between the colonies. So now we can really say it is now the colony <clears throat> which is the target of selection. That colony which is better in communicating, is better defending territories, 
they will have more reproductives produced uh, every year than the colony in the neighborhood, which is perhaps not as good. And whatever is uh, genetically coded in these colony traits will be favored by selection, and those traits which are not does not do not enable the colony so well will be disfavored by selection. <clears throat> um, when we now look at colony level selection or between group selection, a wonderful example which shows how colony traits are shaped by this between colony uh, selection are the leaf cutter ants. The leaf cutter ants live in the neotropics. They cut leaf fragments from, from trees and carry these fragments along huge trails, 100 to 200 meters, 300 meters long trails, trunk roots. As you see here, these walking leaves, under each leaf is a little ant. They uh, move these leaves to uh, their gigantic nests here, and they bring them down into these nests, uh, and they prepare from these leaves. They, they don't eat them. They prepare a humus. And they culture on this humus a particular fungus. And this is a symbiosis. They live from the fungus. They eat the fungus. And this is a symbiosis which is older, almost oh, it's older than uh, 45 to 50 million years when it evolved. It's comparable to agriculture, human agriculture, which is only 10 to 12,000 years old. And they uh, <clears throat> cannot live without this fungus, and the fungus cannot live without the ants. So the fungus became a part of the superorganism. But in order to harvest the leaf material and to process the leaf material and to culture the fungus, the ants have a fantastic division of labor system, which in great detail was uh, analyzed by Ed Wilson in the 80s. Uh, they have these gigantic workers, and they have the small workers. So they are known for their uh, tremendous subcast uh, system. The, the workers are called a cast, and the different sizes are subcasts. Now, I have to say for the non-biologist, this little tiny worker does not grow to become a big worker. Once they close from the pupae, they are made, and they are made, uh, this is an adult worker, and they are made, their size fits exactly to a particular task spectrum, what they do. So uh, the big ones, the strong ones, cut the heavy material, as you see here, and then the whole thing goes through an assembly line. The, the somewhat lo smaller ones, the medium ones, carry in the leaves, then the leaves are processed, and coming down to the fungus, the tiny little ones take care of the fungus. Uh, they keep the fungus clean, and they uh, uh, cultivate the fungus. Uh, here, this is a colony trait, which only can be explained by, or best can be best explained, I should say, by between colony uh, selection or multi-level selection theory. <clears throat> now, there's only one individual in this gigantic superorganism which reproduces, and this is a queen, a huge individual, a reproductive unit, this queen lives 15 to 20 years in the maximum. It mates only once in their lifetime. Uh, she uh, collects 250 to 300 million sperms from about five males she mates with. The males die, but the males, uh, they have only a short life. They have, as I say, only once fun in their life and then they die, but as an ant male, you can become father even 20 years after you died because the ants invented the sperm bank long before humans were on this earth. They can preserve the sperm in the sperm pocket in the body of the female for 20 years. And whenever the queen releases sperms from the sperm pocket to, that an, to fertilize an egg, they become alive again. I mean, they are alive, but then they, they move. They show the total vitality they, show, uh, they would have shown at the very beginning. So this is a remarkable feature in these uh, uh, insects, that they have the sperm bank. Uh, 
I mentioned this because it is really the ultimate uh, demonstration of the superorganism that you have this reproductive unit which can function fully for 15 to 20 years and then the somatic body, all these specialized workers. But part of the superorganism is all the, the gigantic nests. They're huge. They have ventilation uh, um, chimneys here, as you see. The, the fungus produces a lot of of uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, so it has to be ventilated. But in order to really understand how the nests look like on the ground, my colleagues, friends, uh, made a wonderful experiment. They poured in 10,000 liters of water in this nest, mixed with six tons of cement. And they waited for three weeks, and then they excavated this petrified nest. And this is what came out. Unbelievable structures, <clears throat> huge nest, 50 square meters is the area, and it goes down eight meters deep. So deeper than this building is high. <laughs> uh, this this uh, room is uh, the height of this room. Uh, long, straight tunnels, which lead then to the fungus chambers, and they look alive like this. These little, these footballs, not little footballs, they are really football size. And here you see another of these structures. So, all this together is a superorganism. And all is uh, evolved by between colony selection. Now I come to the last example. I talked about briefly about the communication within this, as a superorganism. But if you have superorganisms in a population, these superorganisms have to communicate with one another. For example, when they negotiate a territorial contract. And how they do this, I give you one example. This is uh, in Arizona, one of my favorite study sites, uh, where you have the so-called honey ants. As I say, in, in, to survive in a desert, you need to have a, for, um, a storage policy. Either you collect seeds, there are many, many harvesting ants there, which stores the seeds for the, for the dry season, or you have living storage containers as these honey pots. This, this is a subcast. They have nothing else to do than hanging motionless from the ceiling of the nest chamber. They are filled up with liquid by these normal looking ants, uh, they, they pump this food into these ants, and they, the belly gets really almost cherry size. Uh, and uh, during the dry season, then these storage containers regurgitate food back to the colony. But what I want to talk about is their remarkable territorial tournaments. These ants don't fight to the death like the Ecophila, the Viva ants I showed you before, because they have. Uh, changing territorial borders. For ecological reasons, I cannot go into it. They defend spatial temporal territories, and they do this by display fights. Uh, hundreds of ants assemble on a tournament site and show off. Uh, it may be, say, between uh, two colonies, like here's a, is a tournament, these are the opposing colonies. And if this colony is considerably weaker because it has not enough ants, the display may shift on top of this nest entrance, and they may stop this ant, uh, this colony from foraging by just displaying on it. Or in the extreme, they may just move in, the victors, if it is a really smaller colony, and they raid this colony. They move in, they kill the queen, and then they pillage the nest over the next couple of days. They carry out the pupae. The pupae are carried to the foreign colony where the workers eat close, not knowing that they are now see the light of this world in a foreign colony, and they do the work for a foreign queen. And, of course, this is very close to slavery. Uh, this is analogy to what we invented, uh, human, the horrible habit of slavery. And in addition, these ants pull out the honeypots and drag them over to the uh, victor's nest. And those honeypots which survive are placed back on the ceiling. And they have no other way. They have to serve as honeypots in the foreign colony. And those which are injured, they are simply eaten. 
Now, I'll show you a, a brief movie clip of such a raid. It's not a good movie, but it shows you the behavior. Here, the honeypot is dragged out. It's not very gentle, but they are tough. Most of them, many of them survive. Uh, this is group transport. Uh, and then, as I say, uh, they function in the foreign colony as honeypots. But most of the time, it is not a raid. Most of the time, these tournaments are really demonstrations of strength. And now, I come back to the superorganism. Consider a deer, a deer male, which has the antlers. And the deer male displays its strength to a competing male. They, they fight for a harem of female deers. They show off the bigger the antler, the more powerful they demonstrate they are. And it may not even come to a fight. This is exactly what these honey pot ants do, the colonies. They send out these play ants. They show off. And uh, they, this, during this tournamenting, the ants have a way to count when they, you know, you see this very strange behavior, high on sit, this is not normally how an ant moves. They encounter each other. If it's a nest mate, they briefly jerk. If it's an opponent, they go through this lateral display. So they go through a random in sequence of encounters of nest mate, nest mate, opponent, nest mate, opponent. And they show us that they recognize this. Now, if you assume they have a kind of a head counter, and I, I express it now very simple. Uh, that after a certain number of encounters, they get an idea, quotation mark, what the ratio is. Are we stronger or are the others stronger? Well, this was our original model, but then we filmed the whole thing. It's hundreds and thousands, I have to say, meters of 60 millimeter filming and then later with videotaping. And I still work currently on evaluating these tapes we discovered, I just briefly wanted to show you this display. Uh, one, not very good sequence, but again, it shows you this strange behavior. You see, they, uh, they, this is uh, two opponents. They kick each other with the forelegs. This is the most physical thing they do. Uh, heavy kicking and antenation. Uh, I mean, the quality is limited, but you, I, I hope you see what I mean here. Okay, but when we then really zoomed in and measured trajectories of individual ants, we discovered the following. Most ants don't move very much around. They just display, as these ones here. But there are slightly smaller ones which move through the tournament. And these are the counters. They count. We call them reconnaissance ants. So you could say the display ants are the show off, the endless. And these uh, reconnaissance ants are the sensory organs of the superorganism to measure how strong is the opponent party. And depending on this information, these little smaller ones run home and recruit reinforcement. We have many movie clips now showing this. Or it comes to an escalation to a rate, or they hold the status quo. Uh, so there's no question I could talk for hours about this tournamenting, but I wanted to conclude these tournaments are information centers where the ants gather information about the strengths of the opposing party and accordingly then adjust their strategy. And I can't help to conclude showing you this picture uh, of uh, a tribe in New Guinea the Marings, they do exactly the same. If the two neighbors' parties have a dispute, the males assemble on tournament sites, they bring all the weapons, and they insult each other by shouting terrible words to the other party. And during that time, they count. And as long as they're roughly the same size, no escalation takes place. In the evening, they go home, come out the next morning again, do the same thing until they get bored, so after a couple of days, then it's over. But if one party is negligent or cannot recruit enough display males, uh, then it may come to a rate. Now, as I always say, uh, 
we do not want to be blamed, Ed and I, that we draw a direct evolutionary line from these honey ants to the nothing fights. By the way, this is called nothing fights in pidgin English. It's a wonderful word, nothing fights. Uh, there is no direct evolutionary line, obviously. <clears throat> However, uh, behavioral biologists and behavioral ecologists and sociobiologists, they look for analogies. W what solutions did nature find for similar problems? And this is literally identical, what these honey ants do. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we still do it. Uh, uh, we don't count now and insult each other by shouting words, but we count warheads, tanks, armies, Think about the Cold War. This was all built up more and more and more on both sides, hopefully never to be used, hopefully always stay and nothing fight. But this is basically exactly the same strategy. Thank you very much. Because I answer first this uh, question. Sure, please do. There is, a, there is a study done actually not too long ago exactly as this question, what do the leaf cutter ants do when it is heavy rain? And there are different strategies, whether the nest is a big one or whether these are smaller nests. Mm -hmm. The smaller nests, they are closing the entrances uh, and very tightly. There is a, there is a pay, there is a, they pay something for that because if they do this, uh, carbon dioxide accumulates. And the ants have a high tolerance for carbon dioxide, but the fungus doesn't. So the fungus suffers. And if it's too long, then they again risk and open a little bit. Now, this is smaller nests. Mm -hmm. The big nests, they don't care very much. They may close a couple of their ducts, uh, but, uh, which they do, but they leave other ducts open. And then you know, the water somehow flows off. Some ants, actually, some colonies even build flooding chambers, which, which catch the water. Mm -hmm. They also have an air conditioning system. Yeah. The, um, uh, in the central entrance, uh, 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 galleries, uh, vertical galleries serve uh, to uh, conduct <clears throat> uh, metabolically heated and uh, air from near the center of the nest. And that automatically comes up and slows down. And then into the peripheral nest, I'm sorry, nest galleries of these uh, ants, flow fresh air. So they have a continuous cycle of air through the nest, holding the carbon dioxide level and uh, the temperature as well, uh, pretty constantly. The termites do this extremely well. That's the big mm -hmm. mound building termites of, uh, of Africa, the African savanna, uh, have uh, an even more compact nest with exact temperature and carbon dioxide control in the center of the nest. Temperature is held uh, within one or two degrees, degrees of 31 Celsius and the carbon dioxide level. I don't remember the exact figure, but it's held pretty precisely at one level, too. What is uh, just a last uh, comment still. In addition, in some of the uh, South American leaf cutter ants, they have special uh, debris chambers inside the nest. And uh, one of my uh, former collaborators, they discovered that these debris chambers produce heat. And this is the, the source for the power needed to drive the air conditioning system. Wonderful. So this yeah. is, uh, is a wonderful system. Yeah. I'll tell you, the species aren't always that bright. Yeah. Because you can tell two of the species um, in South America, the common species, by um, the fact that one uses those storage chambers to put their garbage, and the other one carries the garbage out and dumps yeah, it into a huge a, pile outside yeah. the nest. Hey there. Um, the, when you talk about the selection uh, 
uh, kind of happening at multiple levels, uh, the individual and then the, the colony. Could you speak up a bit? Yeah, sorry. I don't think you, those microphones are working, are they? I, maybe I wasn't close enough. We sorry. expect, Better? We expect yeah. uh, Google technology, here, not, <laughs> not Harvard technology. I'll speak later, sorry. <laughs> um, when you talk about the uh, selection happening at multiple levels, the right. uh, individual and the colony and such, um, do you, uh, there's kind of a, a larger concept, universal selectionism. Uh, I don't know if that's the right term. I don't know the literature very well. But do you think this is uh, supporting evidence of the idea of substrate independent uh, selection, uh, evolution, meaning that, um, you know, the idea that evolution, evolutionary forces can happen on different kinds of systems, uh, obeying the same basic implicit dynamics uh, it's, an, it's an older idea, but is this evidence of it? Is this supporting evidence of that idea? You know what I mean? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I understood it correctly, what you... What like people talk about um, <clears throat> ideas and cultures and stuff like that being under evolutionary pressures, right. mimetics, um, and there's a debate as to whether that's a, uh, kind of a strong theoretical framework because there's not a, a strong idea of what the what the selection unit might be and, and things like that. And that's the idea of memes and stuff like that. Um, but I'm wondering if you observe, you know, selection and evolution happening across multiple levels between individual and, and superorganism and such, is that su direct supporting evidence of that idea that evolution is a gener general mechanism that can apply to different types of systems? Let me... I'll try. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I, you're referred to multi-level selection, and I presume you're also referring to the magnitude of natural, the effect of natural selection at the different levels. And you are also referring, perhaps, <clears throat> I've got you right, to um, the um, freeing of highest level, particularly, I would presume, in human societies. Is that yeah, right? And, and my natural selection? And substrate independence, meaning the thing that it doesn't have to be a creature. It could be any any dynamic system. Oh, sure. Okay. Substrate independence. Okay. Yeah, uh, for, sure. You know, there is such a thing as uh, evolutionary computer design in which um, you enter random changes if you have a large array, uh, this can be done maybe effectively, random changes, and you have uh, the machines adapting to the environment by giving them or having some goal, uh, and uh, you let the, the ensemble evolve in that way. You can have uh, the uh, machine that, or the program that is uh, altered that way, mutated, uh, that most takes the largest step forward, produce the next generation of computers, and then on and on and on. I don't know anything about how successful that's been. I've just read about it. We have a screensaver in the front lobby that does that, if you are interested, by the Legos. Okay, so. right. But, uh, <laughs> you know, beware. You don't want to give it any sort of uh, mechanical uh, connection or outreach to the society. <laughs> In other words, you want to keep its intelligence to a certain level, don't you? All right, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious. Obviously, the very complex behaviors going on there, and there are hints of uh, certainly memory going on. There's direction um, and things like that. I'm not quite sure if this is the correct word for it, but can you talk about any evidence of actually teaching um, in in these colonies, mm. uh, where behaviors are are uh, are transmitted essentially socially, or, or are learned, um, or is it just that the ants hardwired and everything it does is just running the hardwired program? Mm. Would you repeat well, the question? Yeah, if you uh, well, it is the, we, yeah. we get it. It's a question more often asked. Whether we have any evidence that there's teaching in ants or, you know, tradition uh, or whether it's all hardwired yeah. uh, behavior. And I think we, we agree there is one paper, and I, this may trigger the question. Uh, about two years ago, uh, there was one paper prominently published in Nature, which 
the, the headline was Teaching in Ants. And this paper, uh, this was just a, a semantic trick. <laughs> mm -hmm. The paper did not report anything new. It's just, uh, you know, used words for this different behavior, and there is no evidence of true teaching. Right. There is one, which is uh, there, there is one example which we might call teaching. This is an unpublished stuff, and it's not worthwhile yet to talk about it. But I would say, and I expect we agree on it, the most of this behavior we observe is hardwired. Is uh, and it, it's it's you know it's not you you have to see it this way. The ants re respond to a, a cascade of key stimuli, and uh, if you take the nest building behavior, no single ant would be able to build such a terrific colony, even if the ant would have hundreds of years to do it. Uh, it is totally dependent on this, uh, we, we always call it as a self-organized structure, emergent structure, but self-organization is just a word, again. As an experimental biologist, I would like to know what are the cascades of signals to which all these different agents respond. And uh, so, but I would say it, it, uh, these are hardwired programs. <clears throat> Why I am very confident to, to say this, because the experts, when you make 10 casts of the same species of these nests, when you make 10 casts of another species, not too, too, too much distant, the expert can say, this is most likely a nest of other cephalotis, can even name the species, certainly the genus, and this is most likely the nest of this. You see, this is actually evidence that is hardwired. <clears throat> the individual variations, which then, uh, and I, I'm not claiming that there is no uh, possibility that ants learn, they certainly do. And how much learned factors go into this behavior, we haven't really studied it very well. We are still busy, busy <laughs> To, we are still very much occupied with understanding the hardwired structures, but this might be in the future of great interest. Mm -hmm. mm. A googly answer, if I might frame a, a, a creative term, a googly answer uh, would be uh, to a different, just a variation on what he said, that the uh, ant colony is very much like the brain, in mm -hmm. that uh, with neurons that do not learn, but they do are modified. Ants can learn local things. They can learn where food is. They can learn what time of the day the food appears and so on, up to five locations. And ants differ enormously in their experience from one uh, ant to the next. Some may have known only nursing, but they know what the condition of the brood is. Others <clears throat> know what a certain section of the terrain is out there. They come and go. That's, they're familiar with it. Others have encountered an enemy of a certain kind <clears throat> and know that that has been encountered and it may be that direction. <clears throat> they communicate constantly uh, with chemical signals. And this is what has addressed, uh, uh, or Holdover has addressed. We know a lot about those signals now. And the fact that the ant colony, even though seemingly silent to us, is a torrent of its ceremonies, signals being passed back and forth, smells, odors, and so on. The ants, therefore, are constantly communicating, and they can, in uh, as a whole, call on the experiences of these different ants, thereby, through the communication channels, and act as an entire colony. Under certain circumstances, the enemy becomes too close and start to invade. The entire colony can respond a large worker force can go out and get particular food, or uh, more individuals can come to nurse the work, the larvae, and, and so on. So, in general, the colony is thinking. There is a colony consciousness, but that's the way it works. And the challenge, I think, is to understand the relationship between that and uh, the operation of the brain, would you say, might be the case? Yeah, okay. <laughs>
If we accept that um, these behaviors are instinctual, have you ever observed a situation in which an ant chose not to be a part of the colony or not to participate or strayed from the group? Ants which are <clears throat> layabouts. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, dismissible, dismissible workers. Well, those which are sick. Ants which are have a parasite, or yeah. they they themselves separate themselves from the colony, especially during night time. When they, you know, if a diurnal ant active during daytime, <coughs> at night time they rest inside the nest, very closely together, clustered. Uh, sick ants, interestingly, well and understandably, the why this was selected, they separate themselves and sometimes stay overnight outside the nest. You but know, there are no for obvious reasons. There are no loner ants. Right? No, no, no. They but may actually are they, they 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 are often the most aggressive defenders men of the colony. This is why it <clears throat> called them the disposal. But this, yeah. some people call them the disposable caste, saying, you know, since you will be going anyway soon, <laughs> just risk everything you have. <laughs> Uh, Bert was describing um, the uh, leaf, the um, weaver ants, and he made this amazing discovery. If I might go on from there, of uh, what did you call them? Garrison nests? Uh, barrack, barrack nests. Barrack nests, but you right. could have called them garrison nests. Yeah, okay, that's true. anyway, that's, <laughs> um, they, uh, the old females, they're all females, you know. Every member of an ant colony is a female. Wow. Now that that's liberalism run amok. <laughs> Males are allowed to stay around just long enough for one uh, function. That could be the subject of another lecture if you'd like <laughs> it. But, uh, the um, garrison nests are occupied by these old females. Mm. And um, they are the old ladies who defend the colonies. And that was, uh, it's an amazing phenomenon. Uh, but there are elites too. That is, maybe it's one end of the curve of activity, but there are individuals who consistently work harder or more innovative, start things more, and tend to be, and tend to activate other workers around them. But again, we haven't, we've got a long way to go before we understand how all that works. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Last question. Okay, uh, so my question is a kind of philosophical one. Um, I was uh, thinking about those uh, colonies you showed, the, um, the one with the ants uh, of the greatly different sizes. Um, and uh, uh, I guess, uh, so I was kind of thinking about uh, that uh, idea of like extended phenotype and everything like that. Um, and so I was wondering um, if you would think that an ant from, from one of these colonies um, that's removed from the colony would not really uh, be um, a complete part of the organism, like this, in the same way that maybe you take a tissue sample from a human, you, and even you though speak the cells. A bit too fast, oh, sorry. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking. Because I don't know. I, I have acoustic I'm not problems. Getting, I'm not getting this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you simplify short? Or, or, or yeah, it was kind of oh, okay. a, not my, right. my thoughts are not clear. Louder, I guess. Please. Um, <laughs> so I was wondering. Yeah, if you would consider talking. an ant that is removed from its colony mm -hmm. to be um, an incomplete organism in the same way that you might consider some, uh, some, a tissue sample removed yeah. from a human. Even though the, the cells in the sample are still alive, they're not really a complete specimen in the same yeah. way that maybe ants removed from a colony yeah. or not. Uh, yeah, no, and and no, this will be... No, we got you. <laughs> for, and Ed, this will be our last question. So okay. uh, if you've been holding anything back... Just I'll let just, it let I'll it fly. Just, I might. I just, sure. I'll just I'll yeah. just uh, yeah. um, answer that with a um, uh, a common phrase you hear: "One ant is no ant." Yeah, and and mm -hmm. you know, no ant indeed can survive alone. Uh, and 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 I want to do add one thing uh, because this reflects. This is some work Ed did uh, in the eighties. You can actually do, you know, take the superorganism concept. Ed, for example, removed, if I now, you just cited my work now, I cited your work. <laughs> and he, he, for example, made an experiment and he said, I take 
30% of all the, chi- the majors out of the colony and see what do they do. And he looked at the work efficiency and so on, and he measured it and uh, saw the deficiencies, uh, could quantitatively measure it. And then he, he transplanted this tissue back and the colony regulated back to normal. Or you can even do, take a long-term experiment there are certain ant species which have majors and minors, and they're always a certain percentage, you know, 30% majors, 70% minors. So you take uh, 20% of the majors out and you wait. The colony will regulate back, will grow back 20% majors until they reach the ratio. And it's again in, uh, stabilized. This shows you why the superorganism concept is, wo- is working. You, you take tissue out, you transplant, you can even make even transplantations, but you have to take young tissue. That means you can take other foreign workers' ants in, and adopt them, put them into, but you have to take them when they are still in a sort of uh, stem cell situation. Otherwise, they would be rejected. If they are larvae, they still are adopted. And then they, it, it, it fits in all these respects, fits beautifully the superorganism concept. I'd like to add what for you dismiss us as to uh, add one quick funny story. Yes. <laughs> uh, and um, it has to do with uh, slavery. Uh, Bert actually was the one who conclusively demonstrated true slavery. That is, members of one, of a, one, a colony of, of the same species, of one species, enslaving members of another colony of the same species. But most of what we call slavery in ants, have been calling it, is that there are species that specialize on raiding other, col- other species and taking them like domestic animals and making them slaves. Well, I once uh, ran an experiment. I had one of the primitive slave makers, that is, they hadn't differentiated too much uh, as warriors, uh, and uh, so, but they depended completely on slaves. So I took away the slaves and watched. Uh, that was amusing. Uh, here was the, uh, the you know, the, uh, uh, the super ant, the Aryan of the, uh, <laughs> of the warrior's class, you know. Their slaves are gone. Uh, what happened? Well, um, they... Um, they perform, uh, and certainly they probably don't do it. It was just residual in the brain, because they always have slaves in nature. Uh, they perform, perform all of the tasks badly. <laughs> uh, the poor larvae were neglected, uh, the, uh, but they did a little bit of that, a little bit of this. And it was just a terrible mess. And, but it was ultimately fatal, because they, they lost the ability to look for food. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So, Thank you very much. One more time. We really appreciate you guys coming out. It's been a great honor. Thank, okay, you. thank you.